Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us. I'm Megan Seagrave, the Executive Director of BioMB, and I'd like to welcome you all to the Atlantic BioCon Student Poster Competition. Uh, if I am looking down at all, it's just because I'm reading off of a sheet. Uh, we are recording this. Uh, we're going to make it available on the Atlantic Biorefinery Conference website, uh, probably not immediately, but hopefully by Monday morning. So just to, just to let you know. This is the first in our, in our series of focused interactive events that we will highlight the bio, bioeconomy in Atlantic Canada. We've partnered with no, the Nova Scotia Innovation Hub, CCMB Innov, and Ignite Atlantic to host this Atlantic Biocon. And we're excited to promote collaboration and increase awareness of the sustainability, sustainability and the innovation taking place uh, in, Atlantic, in Atlantic Canada with our series of events. Today, we're going to hear from six talented college and university students who have shared their research with us by preparing an academic poster and a recorded presentation on their research. These six finalists were chosen from a larger pool of applications, and I'd like to thank everyone who entered the competition. Please feel free to check out all of the posters um, that were submitted. They are also on the Atlantic uh, Biorefinery Conference website. We saw a great mix of projects that address many areas in the bioeconomy, and it's encouraging to see that the future of innovation in our traditional economic sectors is, is so bright. So I'm gonna take a few minutes to introduce our judges who are on here, and you can probably, uh, if they've got their cameras on, you can see them. And um, first I'll start with uh, jo Dr. Fichtali, um, then I'll introduce Sandy Marshall, and then I will do an introduction for Paul Thornton and we'll get them to just kind of do a quick wave as I go. So Dr. Jawad Fichtali is VP of r and Human and Animal Wellness at Acadia Sea Plants. He's responsible for leading uh, resource science, cultivation, process, and product development applications globally for Acadia Sea Plants. Dr. Fishtali earned his PhD in food science and agricultural chemistry from McGill University and his bachelor and master's in chemical and bioindustrial engineering from Leuven University in Belgium. Prior to joining Acadia Sea Plants, Dr. Fishtali held senior positions in leading biotech and biofuel companies worldwide, including Martech Bioscience, DSM, Midori Kaleido Bioscience, and Parable Nutrition. He has more than 25 years of industrial experience in global biotech, food ingredient, health nutrition, and the biofuel sector, and has successfully taken companies from inception to sustainable and profitable commercialization. Dr. Fischtelli has more than 20 scientific publications and holds over 20 patents and patent pending applications. So Dr. Fischtelli, if you could just give us a little bit of a wave so folks can see you. Thank you so much. Our next judge is Dr. Uh, is Sandy Marshall. I almost called you a doctor there for a sec. <laughs> we'll change your title on the on the fly. Uh, Sandy is the executive director of Bioindustrial Innovation Canada. Um, we know it as BIC here uh, um, in Atlantic Canada. Sandy's educational background includes a master's of applied science and chemical engineering from the University of Waterloo. Sandy has over 30 years um, of experience in the chemical and polymer industry and has worked in research, process and product development, as well as market development um, and operations and general management. Sandy finished his corporate career as president and managing director responsible for the Canadian operations of Lanxus Canada. Sandy is currently the executive director of um, BIC, which is a nonprofit business accelerator in Sarnia. Um, Ontario uh, that also manages the $27 million sustainable chemistry venture capital fund. He's the chairman of the external advisory board for the biorefinery research institute, um, otherwise known as BRI at Lakehead University. And he's the chairman of the industrial industry advisory board for an NSERC industrial chair at Western, a member of the aquatic and crop resource development advisory board um, with the NRC, and sits on a, a number of boards, including Biotech Canada and Blue Water Power. So Sandy, if you could give us a bit of a wave so folks know who you are. Awesome, thanks. Our last judge, uh, last but not least, is Paul Thornton. He's the Senior Commercialization Officer at the New Brunswick Innovation Foundation here in, in New Brunswick. As the Senior Commercialization Officer at MBIF, Paul is responsible for managing programs that support the commercialization efforts of New Brunswick researchers. 
He's also passionate about sharing knowledge and expertise around the challenges of commercialization and helping researchers from all disciplines explore the commercial potential of their innovations. Paul's a native of New Brunswick uh, and completed his undergrad training at UMB while um, finishing a PhD in chemistry from Dalhousie University. For the past decade, Paul's worked with numerous academic and startup startups as the technology manager for Green Centre Canada, an organization that works to commercialize innovations in green chemistry and clean tech. He also runs his own freelance consulting business, focusing on assisting early stage companies working to scale and commercialize chemistry-based technologies. So Paul, if you could give us a bit of a wave, that would be great. Thanks so much. I just wanted to thank everyone for volunteering all of their time um, to review these projects. Uh, I suspect they were highly engaging. I took a look at them uh, on the Atlantic Biocon site and I think it's phenomenal. So today we're gonna to be awarding four prizes in the college and undergraduate category. We've got two projects that are gonna be presented. These two students will compete for first and second prize. And in the master's and PhD category, we've got four, four projects that are gonna be presented and we will award uh, a first and second place prize to those two categories. Mm -hmm. All told, um, we're gonna be awarding about $1,500 worth of prize money um, to these uh, to four of the, the top uh, six students. So I'm gonna hand this over to Jen O'Donnell from BioMB, who's gonna help moderate the presentations and the Q&A session. Thanks, Jen. Great, thanks, Megan. All right, so I think uh, we can get started. And um, our first present presenter is Andrew Dix from Cape Breton University. And Andrew's project is the fundamental investigation of QA and QC for industrial birch bark processing. My name is Andrew Dix. I'm a third year undergraduate student currently enrolled at Cape Breton University, and I'm working for the Barron Stowe Research Group. And today I'll be presenting a talk on the fundamental investigation of QAQC for industrial birch bark processing. Now, birch bark is an inexpensive and renewable natural resource that can be used for many pharmaceutical products. And we require efficient and reliable processing improvements of the bark in order for us to extract higher amounts of these valuable compounds. What are these compounds, you might ask? It's betulin and betulinic acid. And betulin is a pentacyclic triterpene. It's a major compound extracted from the outer bark for its medicinal properties, such as anti-cancer and anti-inflammatory, which has been used for to treat psoriasis and eczema. Now, this was derived from a traditional Mi'kmaq skin medicine made from birch bark, utilizing a campfire method, which was passed down through ancestors to two leaders today, one of which who has sadly passed away. As the story goes, my young mother was trying to breastfeed her child and came out in a very bad eczema rash. And she used the birch bark oil to treat the eczema and eventually went away and she was able to feed her child. Now, the first issue we come with our research is that there's a lack of research on the layers of the birch bark. And there are four different bark layers of the birch and each one has different functions and they need to be analyzed. And this is what other research did not look at. So we utilize IR analysis to understand the bark structure and functional groups. The second issue that comes up is there's a lack of research on the particle size of the birch bark. And there's little information about the specifics of the particle size for processing of the birch bark. And that need to be looked at. So the first project was the effects of different layers of the birch bark. And we used FTIR layer analysis and it was performed on all four bark layers to confirm if there were differences that could, be, that could affect the processing of the bark and the extraction of the tool. And what we found is that layer one is very, has weathering and deterioration in some organic matter. And that causes uh, processing, the processing to not work. And for project two, the effects of particle size of brown birch bark. And this is UTGA of 100 mesh and 1000 mesh particle size on the outer bark. And what we realized is that the 1000 mesh has a larger surface area, and has finer particles, and it will react much better. We also realized that after 400 degrees Celsius, uh, major things start to break down. And we realized that between the 100 mesh and the 1000 mesh, the graph showed a different peak. And so we realized the 1000 mesh is better. Now the extraction process used was a soxalate solvent extraction on the ground bark. And the yields obtained were greater than many other studies compared to. And this could be explained by the uses of a 1,000 mesh volume. 
and, increases the, and this increases the sample size, which is accounting for higher yields as well as better TGA and IR analysis data. What's good about the SOX solvent extraction is that it's very cost efficient and is very environmentally friendly. And a great amount of the botulin can be extracted at a high purity rate, which is up to 87%. And the outcomes of our study is that for a better processing strategy of the birch bark for consistent products, layer one should be removed before being processed through the polymer. As well, data from TGA and IR analysis has led to the conclusion that layers four and two are very good for processing. While layer one shows signs of weathering deterioration and before being processed and extracted should be uh, taken out. I just want to thank the Natural Sciences Engineering Research Council of Canada and the Undergraduate Student Research Award, USRA 2020, for providing me and Sarah Boudreau with a scholarship during COVID in 2020. I'd also like to thank Cape Breton University for funding and the Canadian Institute of Health Research, which is a project grant for $852,000 until 2025. Thank you very much for coming to my talk and I hope you enjoyed. All right, so we're gonna uh, promote Andrew to a presenter here. And I just wanted to mention too that Andrew's an undergraduate student at CBU. He's, he's enrolled in the Bachelor of Science program in chemistry. And there I see him up on the screen. So we've got five minutes. Um, there's Andrew, great. Okay, so Joad, you're the first person to ask Andrew questions about the project. Uh, hi, Andrew. Hi, how are you? Um, uh, one question for you. Um, uh, solvent extraction yield depends on uh, numerous factors, uh, including the type of the solvent, the solid to uh, the uh, solvent to uh, solid ratio, temperature, uh, uh, time of extraction, uh, particle size that you mentioned in your uh, presentation. Uh, if you had more time, which factors would you evaluate first and why? And why do you think that uh, Soxlate extraction method is environmentally friendly? Well, okay, let's start first with the environmentally friendly. So that depends on what uh, solvent you're using. And for this extraction, uh, we use methanol for it. And that, uh, unlike other compounds, uh, other solvents, I should say, that allowed it to be environmentally friendly. With uh, the extraction, I believe we used uh, high temperature for this. We use a very high temperature for it. And then with the particle, so the, as what, what we said with the particle size, uh, this was done before in other studies, but for our study, they didn't really utilize uh, the thousand mesh particle size or any certain ones. And that extra percentage, I think it was 87%, allowed us uh, to have a higher percent of the extraction yield, which is what our data showed. Hopefully that answered your question. If there's anything else you'd like me to clarify. No, thank you. Do you look at that temperature? Uh, and uh, you, you mentioned temperature at the time of uh, extraction. In why, why methanol? Do you think that methanol is environmentally friendly? Um, I'm not totally sure. I, I, uh, uh, did not, re I, I looked more at the IR analysis, uh, for this project. So the exoxalate is in my field, but if you'd like, uh, I, if I can get your contact information, I can, I can let you know, cause I can talk with, uh, my team and, uh, discuss that. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. All right, Paul, you're up. Hi, Andrew. Hi. So you highlight the, uh, the different TGA traces that resulted from the different mesh sizes of the bark um, that you got from, from your processing. But what do these traces actually mean? Um, and what, how do you kind of, how do they relate to the success that you observed in extracting the betulin and the subsequent uh, soxlet extraction? So with our a TGA analysis, uh, so TGA is, uh, we chose it because uh, birch bark is uh, insoluble uh, and it's TGA is highly dependent on that particle size in order to obtain that, uh, that data. And so what we used is uh, comparing the thousand mesh to the hundred mesh. You notice if you uh, look at the graphs that with uh, the TGA data of the hundred mesh, 
we're missing some peaks through the DTG curve. And that's typically where uh, major compounds start to break down. And since TGA is a destructive uh, and a, a technique, um, we want to get the most data out of that. And when we're looking at the particle size of um, a sample, since we have that larger surface area and it's, uh, it's much uh, more spread out, it allows us to uh, obtain much better extractions and also obtain much better data. Like with, we used, it has to be consistent with the TG, TGA and IR, and we used as a thousand mesh throughout all of our analysis. So it, can, it stayed consistent with our data. Thank you. Andy, your turn. We got about a minute. Yes. So, uh, how, so, this will be interesting. Uh, this has some commercial implications. How would a company take this research and translate it into a viable business? Well, actually, we're, we're, we're starting to do that right now. So with Betulin and other traditional Mi'kmaq medicine, it has the ability to take those traditional uh, medicines and commercialize it into new products. And since Betulin is an anti-inflammatory product, it helps treat a psoriasis eczema. And currently, uh, Matias's uh, business, we're making, uh, we're turning it into a soap, so that it can be applied externally on the skin. And we've shown through, and it's, it's shown that due to its medicinal properties, it showed to reduce uh, the rashes of the eczema. Great, thank you. Great, thanks so much, Andrew. Um, Thank you very much. It was yeah, uh, nice to have you here. All right, we're going to move on to the next the next project. Um, the next one is uh, from Gordon Harding. He's enrolled at Holland College in PEI, um, and Gordon's project is endobacteria may increase glucosinolate production in broccoli sprouts. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Today I'll be talking about the research project I did for Holland College in which I found endobacteria may increase glucosinolate production in broccoli sprouts. Now let me start by first introducing some of the key characters at play here. In nature, most plants will form a symbiotic relationship with a fungus called mycorrhizal fungi. Now there are two main types of mycorrhizal fungi, of which arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi act as host to endobacteria, both of which give the host plant access to a slew of advantages, such as increased nutrient uptake and increased stress tolerance, both of which also outcompete possible pathogens and establish a successful microbiota uh, within the host plant's root system. Endobacteria in specific have been investigated lately for their potential use in sustainable agriculture products, specifically for their incredible ability to cycle nutrients and to produce toxins and other useful compounds, including indole-3 acetic acid. Interestingly, Broccoli sprouts are one of the few plants that cannot support mycorrhiza and therefore are considered to not support endobacteria. This means that they miss out on all of the advantages provided by the microbiota. And because of this, much research has gone into how to introduce this microbiota or other microbiota to broccoli sprouts and further increase their production capability. Furthermore, broccoli sprouts have been shown to produce large amounts of glucosinolates, such as glucoraphanin, which are considered to be health-promoting compounds. Although research into this is still ongoing, it is promising. Much research has gone into how to increase the glucosinolate concentration within broccoli sprouts, and this has been promising, showing that treatments like UV light, a uh, difference in watering schedules, light schedules, and harvesting times can all influence the glucosinolate production. It's also been shown that treatment with indoleacetic acid can increase the glucosinolate production in broccoli sprouts and hairy root cultures. Considering this, we hypothesize that if an endobacteria were able to exist within the soil and produce enough indoleacetic acid to increase the soil's concentration of the compound, then it would be able to influence the broccoli sprout growth and the glucosinolate concentration of the plant. Now, in our growth trial of broccoli sprouts, in which we treated broccoli sprouts with several different unidentified endobacteria and a known endobacteria culture, P. polymyxa, we found that the known culture was able to actually stunt the plant growth close to that of an endoleacetic acid standard that we also treated sprouts with. Interestingly, another unidentified endobacteria culture, UEB4, was able to stunt the growth of the broccoli sprouts almost as much as this culture. 
Furthermore, um, this one culture, UEB4, produced around 0.8 milligrams per mil of indole acetic acid in the Salkowski's assay. And this was around four times as much uh, compared to all other UEB cultures, which would likely explain the stunted plant growth. The standard P. polyxma culture, or PP, produced around as much indole acetic acid as the other UEB cultures, shown in C, um, although it was able to still significantly reduce the plant type, shown here. This shows that PP probably has another method of reducing the plant growth. Now, if we look at the UPLC analysis of our glucosinolate production in the broccoli sprouts, we see that our non-treated control, B, produced around a 2.7 micrograms per gram of desulfoglucoraphanin per gram of broccoli sprout. Uh, our, most of our UED cultures, one through 15, uh, were able to increase the desulfoglucoraphanin concentration to around 30 micrograms per gram. And UEB4 increased it to around 86.2 micrograms per gram. It is likely that UEB4 was able to increase the DSGR concentration so much more so due to the increased amount of indole acetic acid that the culture produces. Furthermore, uh, the indole acetic acid standard and the P. polyxma culture were able to increase the DSGR concentration uh, to around 130 micrograms per gram, which is incredibly more than the UEB cultures. This is likely because the indole acetic acid used was actually within the inhibitory range, which would stress the plant, causing it to reduce more, uh, produce more glucosinolates. Uh, and the same can be said about the people of chemical. Our study shows that endobacteria is able to influence broccoli sprout growth through production of compounds. Furthermore, uh, endobacteria are also able to increase the glucosinolate production within broccoli sprouts, and some of them are able to do so without reducing the plant growth. This shows that some of the endobacteria in our study may warrant further investigation into use in sustainable agricultural products geared towards producing a healthy organic broccoli sprout product. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. I would like to thank all the wonderful staff and students at Holland College for the help along the way, as well as Fido Cultures for their significant contributions to the study. All right, so I'm just gonna wait for Gordon to appear here on the screen. He's gonna get promoted to a panelist. And um, yeah, just a reminder that Gordon's here from Holland College. The supervisor is, uh, oh, fine, it's your starter's name, but he's uh, in the Bioscience Technology Program. Oh, there he is. Wonderful. You're on mute there, Gordon. Oh, sorry, how's it going? Good, how are you? Welcome. I'm doing great, thank you. Great, all right, so, Joad, you have the first question for Gordon. Yeah, my, uh, my question is, uh, why did you pick broccoli sprouts for your study? And uh, how the results from your study will translate to other crops that would be beneficial to the farmer? That's a really good question. Thank you. Uh, I mainly chose broccoli sprouts because uh, for the study, I actually only had six weeks. And I just know from previous experience that I could uh, elicit a growth response from broccoli sprouts uh, within one week. So uh, that was really the main reason I decided to choose them. Uh, and then through my research, I found that they actually don't uh, interact with mycorrhiza and endobacteria. So uh, then I, you know, found a, another spin, I suppose, to uh, take on that. Uh, and I think uh, we can apply this to other crops, uh, mainly crops that are shown to interact with indole acetic acid, such as uh, potato cultures, so potato cultivars. Um, and if we were to treat those with endobacteria instead of other means of uh, indole acetic acid, then uh, perhaps this could be a cheaper alternative because it would be much cheaper to inoculate a field with a bacterium that would exist there uh, indefinitely pretty much uh, than to retreat a field with chemicals every year. Okay, thank you. Not a problem. Great, Sandy, it's your turn for questions. Hi, Gordon, good presentation. Uh, question I have for you is, how do you envision this technology being commercialized and creating a societal benefit? Uh, that's another really good question, actually. And uh, there's um, a company in Canada that is actually doing this right now. Uh, they're called Micro Inoculants Canada, I think. Um, and they're actually looking at uh, starting a lab on the island. Uh, and I've been talking to them lately. and. Uh, Pretty much uh, this serves as a, mainly serves as an alternative to chemical treatment and to uh, other large scale treatments. And in order, and in, yeah, as a way to uh, benefit society specifically, uh, 
it really helps in the organic food processing market and um, towards mainly people who are sort of against eating non-organic food. This can open the uh, really open the doors to foods that can be treated organically if we were able to find a way to develop this technology to a point where it can compete with most uh, chemical treatments. Thank you. Over to Paul. Hi, Gordon. <clears throat> what would be the most important experiment you would do next to better, better understand the role of your different endobacteria cultures on broccoli growth? That's a really good question. So I think the best way to go about it would be to mimic a, a production setting uh, with these broccoli cultivars. And you would need to uh, use a broccoli variety that is used uh, in glucosinolate production mainly. That there have been varieties shown to have higher concentrations of the compound. You would also need to you would need to find more endobacteria. I was very limited in this study. Uh, you, would, you can really find thousands upon thousands of different cultures in there. So you could really take your time and comb through. And there's many different screenings you could use to uh, screen and find uh, bacteria that are suitable for the assay, such as ones that produce certain metabolites and will exist under certain conditions and whatnot. Um, so really treating more sprouts with uh, more different cultivars in a setting that uh, mimics that of a production capabilities. You would uh, also need to assess the other compounds that are made within the broccoli sprouts. A total phenolic profile of the sprouts would probably be better um, to see what other compounds in the nutrient dynamics are affected. Uh, and there would be really more study, uh, a lot more study needed to really verify that it fully affects the nutrient dynamic. Thank you. We actually have time for another question. Paul, do you have any follow-ups there? Or anyone can jump in. I don't think I had a follow-up, but that was yeah. a, a good answer. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Sandy? <laughs> I, uh, I think you did a pretty good, nice job on answering my question as well. So, uh, uh, so just um, on the uh, topic of uh, uh, how, would, how would you see that you would actually apply the uh, bacterium through a commercial application? Uh, in the field. Right, so uh, in this case, I just put the bacteria in a broth culture and I just directly pipetted uh, uh, one milliliter of the culture onto the, onto the pea pellet. So I think you could really prepare a, a, a bacterial broth and spray it uh, using a commercial sprayer. I, I think that would work. I'm not sure what other methods you could use. You could probably, um, you know, use a physical inoculants. You could probably, uh, you know, prepare some sort of uh, some sort of spike you could put into each corner of a field, maybe the center, and let it grow from there. But I, I think spraying broth over a field would, you know, and that would probably though have many other implications. So you would need to find a different delivery system than just broth, because uh, that would probably uh, probably not be the best to just spray over a potato field or something. Yeah. Great, thank you very much. That not a problem. I hope I gave you a, an alright idea. Yes, I think that was that's a very good idea of the spraying, and uh, there are technologies out there that uh, are similar to that that I think could be leveraged uh, as you've suggested. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks, judges, for thinking on the on your feet there, and, and thank you, Gordon, for participating in this competition and and, uh, and discussing with the judges. So, hope you can stick around for the rest of the presentations. Um, our next presenter is Isha Bisto from the University of New Brunswick. Um, and her project is titled The Design, Synthesis, and Characterization of a Thermoplastic Lignin Polymer. All right, take Hello, play. Everyone. The purpose of my research is to design, synthesize, and characterize a thermoplastic lignin-based polymer to replace an equivalent for a petroleum-based polymer. Through this research, we will be able to reduce the waste created by the pulp and paper industry lower our petrochemical production, as well as produce high performing material. Currently, I have completed the first stage of my research, which is microwave pyrolysis of craftsmen to produce bio-based monomers in the form of bio oil. Due to the heterogeneous nature of craft lignin, we carried out approximately 50 trials at this stage. The research objectives for this stage was to optimize the yield of the bio oil as well as the phenolic content in the bio oil by varying the type of microwave 
receptor, that is the biochar type, as well as the microwave pyrrole with its power level applied. The biol obtained in this stage consists of, consisted of two phases, the light phase and the heavy phase, and they have been denoted by BOL and BOH. The varying factors affected our bio oil yield is such that with increasing power level, the bio oil yield also increased. Additionally, it can be seen that in the presence of spruce biochar, the bio oil yield was larger as compared to when hemp biochar was used. With the gas chromatography and mass spectrometry analysis, it was observed that the phenolic content was over 90% for most of the heavy phase oil. At lower power levels, that is 300 to 450 watts, the phenolic content was larger in the heavy phase when spruce biochar was used, while the phenolic content in the light phase was larger when the hemp biochar was used. At 600 power level, it was observed that hemp was favorable for both phases in the bio oil. Based on our results, it was concluded that the spruce biochar was a favorable microwave receptor to be used as it can combine a good yield as well as good phenol content in the bio oil. Additionally, with the GCMS testing, it was uh, concluded that the high phenol content in the craft lignin bio oil proved its eligibility to replace petroleum-based monomer. In the upcoming weeks, I will be polymerizing the bio oil created into a thermoplastic polymer. The thermoplastic polymer will then be characterized to investigate properties such as viscosity, glass transition, temperature, and thermal stability, and then compared to standard, current standard petroleum thermoplastics available. Working with industrial partners, the novelty of this research in terms of the low viscosity bio-based thermoplastic resin sets the stage for a new standard development for its application in several industries, especially for protrusion composite manufacturing as a polymer matrix. Hence, this research has the merit for securing a, an intellectual property creation. Additionally, the research is also supporting knowledge dissemination by uh, publication of peer-reviewed articles on application of bio-phase monomers to produce thermoplastics. Thank you for your attention and please feel free to reach out to me with any questions. Hello, everyone. Great. Um, wait for Adisha to show up here on the screen to start the QA. Um, and Sandy's going to have the first question once we're ready. Um, I also put some notes in the chat here about uh, we're going to take a quick break after this one. Um, and then I gave you the order of everyone's presentations after the break. All right. So Adisha's uh, here. Um, but I need her to turn her mic and her camera on. And there we go. Hi. <laughs> Hi, welcome. <laughs> okay, Sandy. Well, thank you. Oh, thank you, Disha. That was a great presentation. Um, my question for you is craft uh, uh, lignin is a high proportion of its hydroxyl groups that are in the sulfonated form. Mm -hmm. What happened uh, to the sulfur groups uh, as they went through the pyrolysis step? And how do you see these impacting the polymerization of the bio oil? Um, thank you for your question. Um, uh, at this point, uh, when we did uh, the analysis of our, of our bio oil, we have not been able to quantify exactly um, the chemical groups that you're referring to. What we have seen though, is that 97% of our bio oil is um, a phenolic content that we would be able to, we were looking to find and to be able to chemically modify and to polymerize into the standard that we're trying to um, produce as well. Um, I think going forward that that is something worse to be looking into. So as I just as a quick okay. follow up on that, have you yeah. uh, have you done any polymerizations yet with the bio oil and have any preliminary results? 
not yet. Um, I have not reached that process in my um, in my research yet. I will be going there soon, and uh, I don't know how much I'm able to talk about it. But uh, when we reach the polymerization stage, depending on the results that we're seeing, we have different phases also that we're we're trying to go through to see how effective the bio oil is going to be and characterize to see um, what types of bonds and whatnot will be forming. Um, at that stage also, we will, we'll, we will be able to go back and probably purify and upgrade the bio oil as needed. Great, okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Sandy. Paul, it's your turn. Hi there. Hi. So the specific uh, proportions of the different phenol compounds that you've made in the pyrolysis and the impurities that kind of that are then present in the bio oil, um, they'll have an impact on the types of polymers that you make and, and their properties. Um, for example, molecular weight, polydispersity, that sort of thing. Have you made any attempt to characterize and determine the proportions of the, of the components in your bio oil and or the impurities? Um, uh, for the moment, the only characterization that we have been able to do was the gas spectrometry and the mass chromatography that gave us more so a selectivity of what is there um, based on our volatile compounds. Um, we have thought of doing a per gram of lignin, the amount of a chemical compound that we have, um, but uh, we have not gotten there yet. Um, we're still working on it, but hopefully that should be able to help us. I think the, the GC is pretty, pretty complex or, or not really? Um, yes, and uh, sorry, maybe if you, build, if you are able to rephrase that question for me. Uh, there are a lot of peaks in the GC and I guess a lot yes. of different species, yeah. Yes, yeah, so we, we did have um, part of the GC that did show us others and we were not able to identify exactly what they were. Difficult technique for that, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Shawaz, question for Disha. Hi, Disha. Hi. Yeah, my question to you, um, uh, what are the key physical chemical differences between the uh, bio oil light phase and the bio oil heavy phase in addition to the density? Um, and which fraction is more suitable for polymerization uh, and why? Um, the major difference when we talk about the light and the heavy phase is that in the light phase, we do expect to have more moisture as compared to the heavy phase. Um, so that is something to keep in mind as we're moving forward into polymerization process. Um, saying that the heavy phase would ideally be more um, better for polymerization as we don't expect as much of moisture in it. Um, uh, what we have seen though is that both of them have shown approximately similar phenolic content um, reaching up to approximately 97%, which uh, if we are uh, correctly reacting it with the right chemicals in the polymerization process, we should be able to move it forward. Um, but uh, the heavy phase of the bio oil um, would be the most ideal part. Uh, do you need a polishing step after the uh, reaction before polymerization? In terms of improving the bio oil? Yes. It is, um, and it also relates back to as much as I can share, um, uh, it is part of the experiment right now. Um, there is a step within the polymerization process at the beginning. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks, Disha. We're, we're going to take a quick break here. Um, I also just wanted to note that Disha's um, her supervisors at UMB are Dr. Saha and Dr. Afsel, um, and she's pursuing her Master's of Science in Mechanical Engineering. Um, okay, so we're going to take a three-minute break here just for people to stretch their legs, um, and then we'll resume with the presentation. So see you back here at 2.50.
Heather's in the PhD program at Memorial University of Newfoundland, uh, PhD in environmental science. Um, her supervisor is Dr. Francesca Curtin, um, and she's going to give uh, give us a rundown on her research. Um, her her project is called "Moving Towards Better Utilization of Snow Crab Processing Discards in Newfoundland." Hi everyone, I'm Heather Burke. I'm a PhD student with Memorial University of Newfoundland. In the next three minutes, I'm going to discuss how the Newfoundland and Labrador snow crab processing industry can move towards better utilizing its discards. Did you know that about 10,000 metric tons of crab processing waste is discarded annually in this province? This includes shells, viscera, and other organs. These byproducts, however, have potential for higher value uses. The goal is keeping these materials out of the environment by using simple processes and green technologies to develop new applications for crab byproducts. The first step, however, is to stabilize and characterize the discards, which was the focus of this particular study. As shown in figure one, crab processing byproducts were collected at three different intervals during the 2018 snow crab fishing season. Two pre-treatment methods were used as depicted in figures two and three, control treatment and a seawater treatment. The pre-treated samples were evaluated for sensory quality, elemental composition, and moisture content. They were further subdivided for evaluation of two different drying methods, air drying and freeze drying, as a worst case and a better case scenario. The dried samples were characterized based on compositional analysis, as described in figure one. Throughout the study, three variables were evaluated. This included seasonality, pre-treatment method, and drying method. Each variable had different effects on crab byproduct quality as summarized in table one. Seasonality had the greatest impact on quality followed by pretreatment method and drying method. June samples, for example, were higher in lipids and heavy metals, lower in chitin and had different amino acid pro profiles in comparison to the May and July samples. The collection pretreatment methods affected the quality and the handling requirements of crab processing byproducts as shown in figure six and seven. Treatment with seawater was effective in preventing the blue black discoloration that was observed in the control samples. However, the seawater treated samples became very pliable and were more difficult to process. The drying method had a major effect on fatty acid composition and astaxanthin content with higher polyunsaturated fatty acids, omega-3 and astaxanthin contents obtained through freeze drying. Therefore, understanding the effect of these variables and how to control them will be critical to implementing effective collection stabilization methods for crab byproducts. Figures eight and nine highlight that crab processing byproducts can potentially be used for higher value bioproducts such as crab meal, a fly ash replacement, protein, lipids, and chitin, amino acids, fatty acids, and astaxanthin. So lots of opportunity. However, immediate stabilization is needed using the appropriate technologies to maintain the quality. So in conclusion, I have three suggestions for processors who are seeking alternatives for byproduct utilization for crab discards. First of all, you need to stabilize the material quickly. You also need to understand the characteristics of the targeted end products that you wish to produce. Then you must develop suitable technologies to take care of your byproducts so they are suitable for the intended end products. Thank you. All right, so let's get Heather up here on the screen and the questions. She's here. Um, and then Paul's going to have the first question when we're ready. There's Heather. Heather, can turn your camera and mic on. Sometimes there's a bit of a delay here. Okay. Oh. Hi, Heather. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, All Paul. Right. So my question, uh, if you were to pick a crab byproduct to try and incorporate into a commercial product or make it available for sale, which one would you pick? And what from your study, what factors, what would you base that decision on? Okay, uh, I would uh, pick chitin and uh, perhaps protein and do that as a co-product. Um, the reason for that, there are established chitin markets. Uh, chitin can be converted into higher value chitosan, and there's a uh, there is a um, a big um, uh, or a growing market, I guess, for different types of chitosan products. Whether that be for wastewater treatment to med biomedical applications, um, you know, bone uh, bone grafting, uh, tissue grafting, that sort of thing. So there's a whole range of things you can do with that chitosan, uh, and protein would be the other. Uh, 
the other product because as a function or a byproduct of your chitin and chitosan extraction, you will uh, remove the protein as well. So if you can recover that, then you have another product that could potentially uh, be produced. Interesting, thank you. Shalad, you're next. Hi, Heather. Hello. You, you mentioned in your presentation that uh, seasonality has the greatest impact on quality. Uh -huh. uh, this will present a challenge uh, to produce a consistent quality product commercially. So what would you recommend uh, to processors to overcome this challenge? So in, the, in this particular study, I noticed a big difference in quality, particularly with the June samples. Um, so typically what happens at part way through the crab harvesting season is you get into a condition of soft crab or soft shell crab or new hard shell crab. So those crab would have uh, softer shells, lower in chitin, lower in calcium, uh, and they tend to have more uh, protein uh, because the shell is, is not as dense. So depending on which product the company or the processor wants to target, if they want to target more of the protein and the lipid content, then they may want to harvest in June versus her and use those byproducts from June for that type of product. But if they're targeting uh, chitin and chitosan, then you probably would want to harvest your herder shell uh, product uh, from May and July. Uh, so they really need to understand the, the impact of seasonality on that. The other, um, the other uh, thing that was uh, observed during this particular study is that because the June samples had higher protein and lipid content, they also had uh, higher heavy metal content. So that could be a factor as well that would need to be considered for any end products that are produced and whether or not those impurities can be uh, removed during processing. So those are the types of factors that the, uh, the industry would have to consider uh, if they are to utilize the byproduct and prepare a consistent product. The other challenge uh, that the industry faces uh, with regards to seasonality, um, or not necessarily seasonality, but uh, that's such a short harvesting season, the harvesting season usually it's just started uh, here in, in Newfoundland, so it starts usually in April and runs till maybe June or July, depending on um, when the quota is reached. And because they harvest such a large quantity of raw material in such a short period of time, it may be difficult to separate out those byproducts uh, to, to develop the consistency that's required. So those are some of the challenges uh, that need to be overcome to produce a commercially um, consistent product. Thank you. Is is the uh, the interest in uh, is it in mainly the protein, the, the lipid, the chitosan? What is the main the main interest in, in the in the byproduct? Uh, well, right now, the main interest is the chitin uh, and then further conversion to chitosan. Uh, there are a number of companies, uh, small biotech companies that uh, want this material. Um, every year, I think we uh, get approached by various uh, groups uh, right um, for internationally looking for sources of shell for um, chitin extraction and, and chitosan conversion. So that would be the main product. Uh, but however, as I mentioned previously, the protein could also be a good source uh, as a meal supplement or a, a feed supplement for, uh, it could be aqua feeds or poultry, et cetera. The main challenge with the protein um, is that it's low in uh, two essential amino acids, lysine and methionine. Uh, so I found that in my study, and there was another study done with the same species a few years ago, which found the same, uh, the same uh, limitation with the amino acid uh, content. So that would have to be supplemented somehow if that uh, protein were to be used as a feed additive. Thank you, Eva. Thanks. Heather, very good presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, so uh, how do you see the crab processors actually collecting and stabilizing the byproduct? Uh, and particularly, are they already equipped to do this as needed or would it require them to do something quite different than they're used to? Yeah, so the uh, I'll answer the second part first. No, they are not equipped to do that, which is why I selected that as part of my study. Uh, the challenge, as I mentioned previously, um, they get a large volume of raw material in such a short period of time, they don't really 
have the capability right now to handle it and stabilize it properly. Uh, the plants that I visited here locally, um, they collect everything in one large off-all bin at the end of the production line. It sits there until the bin is full. Usually it's outside the plant. So we harvest during May, June, July uh, when its temperatures are getting warm. So that sits there, gets very warm. And, you know, if, if something's not done with it or handled, if it's not handled properly, then obviously you're not going to be able to, to extract anything valuable from that because it deteriorates quickly. Uh, so the, they would need to come up with uh, some method of collecting and stabilizing that byproduct. So rather than putting it into an all-fall bin, which stays outside in the heat during the uh, warm temperatures, it may have to go into another collection vessel that is chilled or cooled. Uh, so one of the, um, the options that we've been looking at is can you create some type of a collection vessel uh, directly beneath the crab butchering station? So uh, if you're not familiar with crab uh, processing, the main product that's produced here is a is a crab sections. So the crab is actually butchered in half. The carapace is popped off, and all the um, internal organs, so gut, gills, etc., get dumped into a um, uh, into a um, uh, flume underneath the um, underneath the butchering machine, and then it's just flumed using water out to the offal bin. So rather than having it flumed to an offal bin, if they could collect it directly beneath the butchering station uh, and chill it. Um, so I found that cooling, quick, quickly uh, cooling that raw material helps to stabilize it. And then if they could quickly freeze it, uh, all the plants have uh, freezing capability. Uh, so they would have to do some modifications to how they collect that uh, material and then figure out how to stabilize it. Great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Very Great. interesting. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Heather. Um, Thank you. We have to move on to the next one. Sure. Um, so our next uh, presenter is Isabel Quenza, also from Memorial University. Um, Isabel's project is titled Oxidative Degradation During Storage of Atlantic Salmon Byproducts, Impacting the Salmon Bioeconomy. Um, so we'll take a look at her five minute presentation. Here we go. Good day. My name is Isabel Cuenca. I'm a student at Memorial University of Newfoundland working under the supervision of Dr. Betty Cadet. I am glad to share today our project about oxidative degradation during storage of atlantic salmon bacteria, impacting the salmon beer coin. Salmon is the leading marine farmed species in the world, occupying place nine. The principal producers are Norway, Chile, United Kingdom, and Canada. The market demand of products such as the slides and peel generate up to 50% of products in this car, representing around 70,000 tons in Canada. The industry recover value transforming these discards in products such as animal feed fertilizer, while a portion goes to landfill, representing a challenge in waste management and impacting the environment. Salmon discards are potential sources of the important biological compounds. Nevertheless, the high perishability leading to quality loss limit the potential. Oxidative degradation is the principal process leading to quality loss, especially in fatty fish such as salmon. While limiting oxygen and adding antioxidant are the most common strategies to avoid oxidation, tissue disruption and the hemoglobin content at are two important factors to explore. Therefore, the aim of this objective was to evaluate the effect of reactive organs, and evaluate the effect of processing methods, and evaluate the effect of an antioxidant in the lipid oxidation of head, brains, and viscera during storage. To the best of our knowledge, this is the first approach in recognizing and removing the reactive organs from byproducts for the stabilization of fish wastes. Gills were removed from heads and liver by heart, gonads, spleen, and bladders were removed from viscera, remaining gill, head, brains, and digestive viscera as byproducts without reactive organs. After the organ removal, by products were subjected 
to a mid toner for a low processing and to a mid grinder for a high processing with the addition of an antioxidant based in rosemary extract. Samples from the mid tumbler without antioxidant were taken as a control. After the uh, storage period, the oil was extracted enzymatically and the oil was recovered after centrifugation for the analysis of total oxidation, free fatty acid and fatty acid profile. In a preliminary study, reactive organs and grinding method statistically affected lipid oxidation, especially in viscera, after seven days of storage at 10 degrees. And therefore, for the frozen storage, all organs, uh, reactive organs were removed and tumbled uh, metal was considered the control. During the frozen storage, the grinding method statistically affected the lipid oxidation, while the use of an antioxidant showed a low impact when added to tumbled byproducts and a higher impact when comparing to ground byproducts. From the three byproducts, viscera, uh, developed the highest oxidation. This was related to the release of free fatty acid catalyzed by the digestive enzymes. The results present tumbling method and removal of reactive organs as potential methods to stabilize salmon byproducts. We believe that these findings can impact positively the salmon bioeconomy. I want to express my gratefulness to my supervisor my university, and the Atlantic Biocom for this invitation. I invite you to share your questions and comments, and feel, please feel free to engage through email and LinkedIn. Thank you. Great, so we'll wait to see Isabel here on the screen. And once she's ready, um, Paul's gonna have the first question for her. Isabel, there she is. Hello. Hey, welcome. <laughs> so I have a question for you, Isabel. Yes, Paul. Uh, your study has a storage stage occurring in sealed plastic bags. Was there any attempt to quantify the amount of air or oxygen incorporated into the samples uh, in the processing or and prior to storage? Uh, you are referring to the uh, packaging of the samples for the yes. storage? Yeah. Okay, as the oxygen is the main uh, compound promoting oxidation, uh, some kind of strategy should be used for the removal of this oxygen, such as vacuum, for example. In my, during our first uh, uh, experiment, we let some oxygen inside because we wanted to uh, promote this oxygen the, uh, the lipid oxidation and then compare which method uh, reduces the oxidation. In the case of the frozen storage, that is the, the, the main uh, study uh, in our research, we used vacuum package. Uh, we used vacuum. Do you know if there's any variance between the different uh different runs or different methods even as, as far as the amount of oxygen that's being left? I would think that a, a, a modified atmospheres will be maybe a better, a better method to control the oxygen inside the bags, but this will be a, another, another line of the research that, that will be very important to be analyzed, to analyze. For this experiment, uh, with only the vacuum package and the uh, strategies that we tested, we found that uh, the polyunsaturated fatty acids that, that we are trying to keep uh, with high quality, they were not uh, destroyed in any way. So for this experiment, the vacuum package was enough, but it will be very interesting to try control atmospheres at, uh, and uh, modified atmospheres against a vacuum. But uh, in, the, in the research that we have uh, uh, conducted with other research, 
uh, from other uh, universities that are looking towards the stabilization of byproducts, uh, they are uh, using the vacuum, the vacuum method with good results. Thank you. Sandy, it's your turn. Thank you, Isabel. That was a very good presentation. Um, obviously, lipid oxidation is the biggest issue we have here. Uh, yeah. Do you believe that there is a, a way to control this degradation sufficiently so that we can, so that this could be made into an economically viable process to be commercialized? Definitely, yes. I do think that we can control uh, and uh, reduce in an amount that we can uh, during a period of time that we can we uh, that, that we can be able to process and to extract. Uh, the bio compounds. Uh, to, in my point of view, uh, it will be it, it it is important to start with the oil because all the processing is uh, it, it, it is developed and scaled. And uh, the second step will be to think uh, on the proteins, the minerals, enzymes, and everything else that we can extract. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Shall I add your turn? Hi, Isabel. Hello, Dr. Fichel. Um, uh, free fatty acids are more prone to oxidation than triglyceride. And you have shown in your graph that uh, uh, high free fatty acids translate into higher totex value. So my question, how can you minimize the formation of free fatty acids in the product? And what is the reason that your totex values they go up and then they peak and then they go, they go down over time? Okay, uh, the way to reduce the free fatty acids, free fatty acids are uh, developed through two main uh, chemical reactions that are the oxidation, but mainly for the hydrolysis from the endogenous enzymes. That is why we have in the uh, viscera, we have the highest free fatty acid uh, release. And the way to reduce this release of free fatty acids will be um, uh, trying to tackle the uh, enzymatic activity because this is giving more uh, free fatty acid devel uh, release. Then, uh, as for example, in viscera, if we take uh, if we take the, the stomach apart, uh, we could be losing a lot of oil. So one way could be uh, the easiest way to uh, inactivate an enzyme that will be a heat, but a heat will be promoting lipid oxidation in the other side. So I wouldn't think that a, a boiling or, or heating the byproducts should be a suitable way or method to, uh, to reduce the free fatty acid release. I think that um, heads and frames have a very low level of free fatty acids. I wouldn't think of uh, this is a, a, a concern or, an, or a, an issue to use the byproducts uh, for um, the maximization of the value. But in the case of viscera, uh, this is an issue that, that we have to address. As I said, I don't think temperature uh, is, the, is the way, but um, I, will, I will try to uh, to look for another another method trying to avoid the the, the temperature. Right now, I, I don't know which method will be this. This is a very important, very interesting uh, topic that you are touching, uh, but viscera should be addressed in a different way to try to reduce the free fatty acids because they are not coming from oxidation, they are coming from uh, lipid hydrolysis. Uh, uh, and re, What's re, about the pass of TOTEX uh, going up and down? Why, why does it happen? The uh, chemical reaction of uh, oxidation, uh, it, it uh, 
comprises a lot of steps. In these steps, one product uh, is, is formed, and with time, this product is uh, uh, broken down, and another uh, subproducts are formed. In these graphs, total oxidation are uh, uh, represent the um, peroxides and uh, aldehydes that are formed for in the oxidation and when the uh, when the graphs goes down it means that these products are breaking are breaking bro are broken down and uh, another another products uh, tertiary oxidation products are being formed these are not shown in these graphs for that i will have to do other analysis now you have answered my question very well thank you thank you thank you Thank you, Isabel. Uh, we're going to move on to the final uh, presentation for today. Um, and that's going to come from Juliana Vidal. Um, Juliana is also at Memorial University of Newfoundland. Um, it just happens we, we made it the list alphabetical and the final three are from Memorial. <laughs> so this is the Newfoundland section of the afternoon. Uh, yeah, but Juliana um, is uh, going to present on biochar as a next solution for the achievement of a bioeconomy. Um, Julia is in the PhD program at Mun um, in chemistry. So let's listen to her recording. Hi everyone, and I'm doing my PhD at Memorial University. In this presentation, I'll be talking about the investigation our study starts in the middle of the woods during the production of food that a soft number of paper The kind of things we the parts of the seeding, The problem with the conservation of this biomass strategy is that we really need to be more in our atmosphere. There's a process, however, known as pyrolysis that can help elucidate the theory. Um, so these pyrolysis waste biomass from trees or even from agricultural residues that is burned under low conditions of oxygen and transformed into biochar, a part of material that decomposes way more slowly. So therefore, pyrolysis is able to reuse carbon from a rapid biological cycle into a much slower cycle promoted by the production of biochar. Bioarm material also focuses on the process and it's a preferred use as a source of renewable energy in In terms of its structure, uh, biochar is a material that presents biological shapes with the personality of the area, but it is mainly used in low value added cooling In our research, we've been looking into different strategies to actually improve the biochar of the tree. So the first one consists in the investigation of dyed biochar as a catalyst to produce bicarbonates, which are compounds used in this tree. So by using oxidized biochar as a catalyst for the composition reaction between these and epoxides, it could produce a material that um, sequesters CO2 um, during production to further um, apply as a catalyst for a process that can form CO2 into citric carbonate. And by doing that, it could help to mitigate climate change effects while we can provide these things. So during studies, we found out that oxidized biochar could facilitate the reaction to like the bonding the biochar from different biomass food stocks to be used to promote the reaction under mild reaction conditions that a wide range of uh, substrates could work for a catalytic system, and also that oxidized biochar can be reduced for at least five times, um, being a sustainable, renewable, efficient, and also recyclable catalyst for the supervision reaction between CO2 and oxygen. So the other strategy that we considered was the increase of biogenification via a process known as liquid phase exfoliation, or LPE system. So during LPE, the layered material is immersed in a solvent and its weak interaction between layers are broken using ultrasound to produce nano sheets containing enhanced chemical and physical properties. We wanted to study the applications of the nanostructures of biochar 
So we found out that he, helped, he had been previously done in a toxic solvent in the health environment. So we took a step back and decided to perform DLT in human solvent before studying the application of the exfoliating material. So in the second investigation, we were able to correlate exfoliation efficiency with the density, surface tension, and also the similar tank parameters of the solvent here. We could produce biochemical sheets to give uh, 15 nanometers thickness in solvents such as sulfatol, ethylacetate, and also carbonate, uh, whereas oxidized biochar could be created in solvents like salt and electrode. And we also uh, could exfoliate samples for at least two hours without being wrong. So, in summary, uh, we have applied two different strategies so far for the diversification of biochemistry, but we believe that this is only the beginning. By applying carbon material that is obtained from waste for the production of advanced materials, uh, we can produce industrially used chemicals, we can and help to boost the whole uh, bioeconomy concept through the transformation of waste into something valuable. So we believe that this is key and a very important piece for our achievement to a truly sustainable system. So with that, I'd like to thank all the participants in this project, my supervisor, my co-supervisor, um, and the organizers of the Atlantic Bio Council of this wonderful conference, and also thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you. Thanks for bearing with us on that one, everyone. I know it was a little difficult to, to hear, but uh, I could I could make it out turned up. So I hope most of you could. Um, I'll just remind you of the link I put in the chat earlier. Um, you can view all of the, the videos, including Juliana's um, um, on our website. Um, and uh, yeah, we just had a bit of a technical issue with that one, um, having to do with how we download the videos and the video, um, the, the quality of the file. So apologies again. Um, but yeah, I definitely recommend checking out that video um, on your own time. Uh, so I see Juliana here. Let's get her to put her mic and her camera on. There we Hi, go. Everyone. Hi. <laughs> I hope Sorry. I'm louder now. <laughs> yeah. okay. Here you're fine. Here you're fine. Sorry we couldn't uh, get that one going live uh, the way it was meant to be seen, but uh, pretty easy to find online now. So we should check it out. Okay. So Sandy, you're first on the list for questions for Juliana. Great, well, thank you, Juliana. The presentation was very interesting. I, you showed that the liquid phase exfoliation can be used to produce 15 nanometer uh, thick na uh, nanostructures. Have you characterized the nanostructures? And if so, what industrial applications do you see these materials potentially being used for? Thank you very much, Sandy. Yeah, so we did some Raman in the um, exfoliated material as well, and also did um, some TEM, some, S some SEM, yes, on those particles to characterize them, and the AFM also to get the thickness of the, the particles. And now we're actually trying to use them as additives for polycomposites. So we're using to show that, we just finished the manuscript, to show that polycap electron can be stronger if you use um, those, uh, those exfoliated biochar. So that's how I'm using it. But I see in other um, applications such as in, in electrochemistry and also they are using for, for soils as well, showing that's better than the normal biochar. So I can see that the exfoliated one is better than the normal biochar and we just need to study it more kind of thing. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Joad, it's your turn for questions. Uh, hi, Juliana. I listened to your presentation a couple of times, so that was not an issue for me. <laughs> Everyone hears very well. So it's uh, um, what was most clear to me um, uh, how your uh, um, you work complements uh, previous published studies or some work that has been done, how does complement that? Uh, if you can uh, just elaborate briefly on this point. Yeah, so thank you very much, Dr. Fitel. So the thing was that um, when we started to study the applications of the exfoliated biochar, we were like, okay, maybe because every time that we think about biochar, we're like, what can graphene do? And we're like, okay, let's see if we can use biochar for those things as well. Kind of like, let's see if it works because it's kind of similar. So when we tried to see the exfoliation and the liquid phase exfoliation, we saw that people had already done it. 
um, we're like, okay, we can do the liquid spoliation then, I guess. But the solvent that they used was really toxic. And so at this moment, we're like, let's take a step back and see if we can do this process, but using um, greener solvents first, so we can increase the applications of this material actually before using it for something else. So maybe it wasn't planted, but we see, okay, we're a green chemistry group. We can't use NNP, it's not very safe. It's, very, it's a reprotoxic solvent. So let's see if we can understand more of the exfoliation before actually using this material first. So I hope this clarifies um, what, what we've done. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Paul, you're next. And, and we still have almost three minutes. So um, maybe you have to think of a follow-up if we I'll, have time. I'll speak slowly too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so I just a question for you in your opinion, Juliana. What what do you think would be the main barriers or obstacles uh, for a chemical comp company that wanted to use um, oxidized biochar in, in a potential commercial process, making cyclic carbonates or some other type of product? So thanks, Paul. But yeah, the way I see it, and it's a lot of um, what's actually limiting the applications of biochar in higher ed value added fuels as well, is like the, the characterization, right? So like we kind of have an idea of the structure is looks like and everything, but we can't be like, okay, this is the structure for sure. So we do everything we can to kind of characterize it. And as well, you have the problem of the biochar being um, dependent on everything, basically the pyrolysis conditions and everything that you do during the pyrolysis can change the structure of the biochar. So depending on the temperature, you can have a biochar that's more aromatic or not. So, um, and all of the parameters can change. So I think this is, this is a problem that I see that uh, people are kind of like, okay, um, you don't know exactly how your material looks like, but I think we do our best. And I think like having, keeping in mind that you're using waste actually like from wood waste to actually do something with it and um, use as a catalyst for a reaction that produces uh, materials that are used industrially. I think this is something really important. And even though we can't have everything perfectly, I think we need to keep in mind that we're addressing the sustainable development goals and going to this, this side of things um, to actually work more on the, the characterizations of biochar. Um, so I think that's a problem and I think um, we need to work on that. Thank you. Thanks. So you want a follow-up question? Go for it. So, uh, okay, in your first piece here, you're, you're talking about oxidized biochar as a catalyst. Yep. So, uh, you know, when I think about uh, biochar, it's not a very expensive material. So, so from that standpoint, we're not all, we're probably not all that concerned about the consumption of it over the, or through the process. But nonetheless, you've identified it here as a catalyst. And as such, it's driving these uh, chemical reactions. Have you done anything to assess the stability of the biochar as a catalyst and uh, by doing multiple, multiple cycles? Uh, and, uh, and if so, do you see uh, a certain level of degradation and, and uh, do you have concerns with that degradation that is causing other negative impacts? Well, thank you, Sandy. So we actually, we did um, a recycling study and we saw that the biochar is good for this specific reaction for at least five times. And the idea is actually to have like a, a process you can actually have a flow reactor, something we think about it as well. But um, actually like we did that and um, like I haven't studied anything like in terms of degradation of oxidized biochar or anything like that. But in terms of the material, people say that the normal biochar can be stable for at least a hundred of years kind of thing. They did it. So uh, in terms of the oxidized one, uh, in terms for this reaction is really good, but it's something that I always do with my um, reactions as I'm doing something more with the biochar as a catalyst now. So we're always checking the recyclability to see um, if we can use um, it for more times and keep going as long as, as much as we can. Great, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sandy. Great. Thank you, judges. Thank you, Juliana.